Um, so these YouTube videos are useful. Um, last winter, we did a bunch of study sessions where we went through all kinds of different things. We did Bolitz, we did Amanita, we did uh, Puffballs. So all of those recordings are up from last year. So if, if I recorded it, I have them up there. So there's some good study sessions there from last year. Um, so tonight we are talking about Russellacea, Russellacea, however you say that, um, and specifically Lactarius. So I'm, this is a very, very brief refresher from last week. I am going to jump in here. So we are talking about Russellaceae, which is a family within the Russellales uh, order. And in there, this is the uh, outline of fungi, which is this massive paper that came out a while back. It's online, an online resource um, that tries to categorize all this stuff. Um, within this order, there are a bunch of uh, families, the Albatraceae, which is some of the things like Albatrellus we know of. Um, this family, which I'm not even familiar with. Um, oh, Lentinellus is in there. So there's some uh, some familiar things in there. Bonder Zooiaceae, which are those, contains the Bonder, Bonder Zooia, those big polypore-like things. The Chinodontiaceae, which is a pretty obscure group, although this one, the Chinodontium, is pretty famous from New Jersey. You see Ellis here is one of the, uh, Ellis and Everhardii, or Everhart, I'm sorry. Um, those are the two guys from Jersey and Pennsylvania, respectively. Um, Periaceae, which of course has like lion's means in it. Uh, this one, I don't know what this is. Hypogastraceae, I imagine it's some sort of puffball like thing. Pineophoriaceae, which are a lot of crust. Russellaceae, which we're talking about tonight, which I'm gonna come back to. Steriaceae, which contains a whole bunch of different things, including the uh, sterium group. This group, I'm not sure, um, I'm not really sure what Xenasmataceae are. And then of course this Russellaceae's insertacetus, which means they're in this group, but it's, there are uncertain placements. I think that's what that actually means. Uncertain placements in that. Look. Yes. Sorry. Senamastaceae are crusts. No, I don't think so. See, I know the Senamastella vaga. But look at these. Some of these are not like. No, no, no. Senamastaceae before. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I misunderstood what you're saying. Before. Yes. 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 So these, these are crusts to their cross. closely yes. related to the family we're talking about. These guys, which are all things that we don't really know where they belong, they're in Rusa Alley's now, but we uh, are not really that convinced that they really belong there. And then that's it for this order. In this order, we have the Rusa Lacea, which we talked about last week. So there are um, three of these that are crust, these Boydinia, which actually has them. Yeah. Next have one. Them. Yep. Bodinia, this uh, Glowio pineophorella, and the Pseudo Zenasima, which only has one genera in it. And we looked at some examples of those last week. And then, of mm -hmm. course, we have this Baltiferca, which is this oddball thing that seems to kind of straddle, has, uh, has traits of both Lactarius and Brusilla. And then, of course, the Brusilla, which these guys are claiming there are greater than 3,000 species in the world, which I would not be surprised at all. And then, of course, what we're going to talk about tonight, Lactarius and Lactofluus. So both of these are things that we see commonly in the New Jersey area. There are a lot of them, 450 and 207, respectively. And these are what we call the milk mushrooms. Generally, the milk mushrooms are, uh, are guild fungi that exude some sort of latex. As far as I know, they're all mycorrhizal. They all grow in association with uh, some sort of plant, trees, shrubs, stuff like that. A couple of these, like the Bodinia, this, this one here, and this single specimen here, those are actually wood decayers. I had read that they're very basal in the lineage here. Um, so very uh, archaic 
you know, some of the original members of this family probably that, uh, or similar to some of the original members of this family and are still wood decayers while the rest of these have evolved to become uh, uh, ectomycorrhizal. So anyway, that's a, just a really brief recap of some of the stuff we were talking about tonight, last week. Um, and we we're looking at lactarius and lactofluus this week. I'm gonna stop my screen sharing. Um, as we start to look at stuff, if people could help out by typing the names of what we're talking about in the chat, um, makes everything a little easier to follow along. And I do have some emails from a few people, um, but first I'd like to give others the opportunity if you wanna share from your own screen and share lactarius or lactofluus or similar milk mushrooms. I don't know if there are any other similar ones. Um, this is your chance. So uh, who would like to go first? Anybody wants to share from their own screen? Okay, cool. I will jump back into my emails and start looking at some of the stuff that people have sent me. Can you see my emails? Or do I have to start over? Yes, you can see it. I'm gonna start with Penny. Are you with us tonight, Penny? Yes, I'm here. Oh, excellent. Okay, you sent me two emails, right? I sent you two, yeah. Okay. And so, um, this one is just a guess that I, I am not sure of. I I found it, uh, These uh, both of these were from in the summer in the Adirondacks and um, I tried on this one, I, I just tried to use the uh, key in the, um, what's his name's book? I forget now. <laughs> um, anyway, they're a very slimy cap. Um, they had um, white latex, I think. I think you could see it in the next one. Well, scant white latex. So um, I would love, welcome any comments that anyone might have on um, what they think. Okay, so I, I should have mentioned this when we first started, um, but um, and so we'll ask you this. Some of the key things that we're looking at when you're trying to identify lactarius is taste, how the mushroom oh, tastes. Okay. Um, okay. Of course, habitat, of course, right? We always want to know what kind of trees it's with. And then this latex is important to notice um, the color and then the color changes. So, and additionally, sometimes we're, we actually taste the latex and we look at the, any staining it may be doing on the gills. So it looks um, a little greenish on the gills there. It does look a little bit greenish. And then the one other thing that, that with like terrace, you have to kind of take your time with is once you get this latex, so it looks white here, it's usually useful to check in again in five minutes and then like 10 minutes and see if there's any color changes as it, uh, as it dries. So okay. those, those are all the different things that we are looking for with Lactarius to identify them. So you called this Lactarius affinis? Yeah. Okay, I have my book out. I'm not familiar with that species, but uh, maybe somebody else has. I've, I've got my book open right here. And this certainly looks like Lactarius ethminus. And something I just read here. Um, where is it now? Um, oh, now I'm, now I'm not looking at it. Uh, well, anyway, it says here someplace that it does. Oh, oh, Lactarius ethminus variety. Uh, Viridolactus, um, the white latex dries pale olive or olive. And it looks like that's what we see here right near the stock there. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, I mean, this mushroom certainly looks like Lactarius Athenas. You have to taste it though. You have to taste Lactarius. Okay. Well, I, you know, this is actually from a couple summers ago before I knew about Mushroom Observer and all that kind of stuff. So I, 
I might have tasted it. I would have to look in one of my notebooks, but uh, I doubt it. <laughs> did you um, were you did you attend last week's? No, I wasn't able to. Okay, I, I I explained something that I like to do. <clears throat> um, when I taste a mushroom in the field and I have my camera, I take a picture of my hand, and if I take a picture of a fist with no fingers, that means it tastes mild. A half of an index finger means slightly bitter. An entire index finger means bitter. Halves of my first two fingers means slightly acrid. Two fingers like a peace sign means acrid. And three fingers means just really hot and, and um, unple unpleasant. And that way I, I can just snap a picture or two pictures maybe because sometimes the taste changes after a minute. And I just snap a couple of pictures and then I have a record of, um, of what it tastes like. Oh, that's great. I'll have to uh, remember that. Well, that is a good idea. I've started you doing that too, Dave, since you've uh, mentioned it a few times. Could you, could you say that again? Because, it, well, I can look at, well, I can you look can, at the you last just week. Make up your own system. Okay. But it's, just, it's just convenient <laughs> to, to not have to try to remember everything or have right. to just get out a pencil and a paper and start writing stuff down in the field. You know, yeah. I try I try to uh, take as many visual notes as I can because then they're just they're all on my on my camera. Then I put pictures on my computer and everything's there. Cool. So Eileen asked what it should taste like. So I think you got you kind of just explained that, Dave. But just to reinforce that, they're usually very mild tasting and just, you know kind of mushroomy or dirt like. Um, well, this some, one's this some, sometimes. And thinnest, Oh, I'm sorry. Good. I was I was just reiterating all the different types of flavors that these uh oh, like carries. Oh, could be mild, in which case you know it doesn't really taste like much of anything. Could be slightly bitter, or noticeably bitter. It could be slightly acrid, which is kind of burn a little bit burns a little bit, or it could be noticeably acrid. Um. Or some of them are just really immediately strongly acrid and and peppery in, in a bad way. And um, and sometimes you'll take a taste and at first it's mild or maybe slightly bitter. And then after a minute, it changes a little bit on your tongue. You start to notice the acrid taste a little bit more. So that's why sometimes I'll, I'll take two pictures. And and then the camera shows me what time the pictures were taken too, so I I can also see you know how many seconds passed or well how many minutes passed actually it's only um, accurate to minutes, but this looks like I think you've identified this correctly. Yeah, it de it definitely looks like what I'm seeing. It really looks like book. it, and they mentioned the um, sticky to slimy cap when when it's fresh. That's mentioned in the book also, and it looks just like the picture. Honestly, that's that's in the uh, the milk mushroom book. All right, good job, Penny. Nailed it. <laughs> um, and this is one of my favorite ones because it was one of the first Lactarius I was able to identify, um, Lactarius thyenus, and um, it's you know orange with the typical Lactarius rings uh, on the cap, and um, it ha it it was also in the Adirondacks in a wet area in the woods, uh, which is kind of a spring um, bubbling up. Um, I ca I can't I mean that you could see there are oak leaves. It uh, bruises orange and doesn't um, uh, and the the latex is orange and doesn't change, and it has those lacuna the um, pits on the stalk and uh a bright orange so it's really pretty certainly looks like it to me one thing you want to do though is cut it either on the stock or on cut it and cut the cap in half and just press your finger up against where the flesh is cut and make sure that you can see orange latex okay uh, because there well, are some white latex orange cap milkies. Um, right. Yeah, well, this so that's, one that's when the you, easiest way to tell. When the stalk is cut in this picture, it, it turned orange. 
you can see you can see there it, it really looks like it's got orange latex and if there's any at all green staining then it then it's not thyanos then it's going to be um what the books are calling deterimus um but there's some there's that name is that deliciosa or is that an older name deliciosa is uh a european species oh i see yeah it used to be deliciosa in in the north american books but then they went over to deterimus and now it looks like deterimus is really more than one thing and and that now they're saying deterimus is also um a european name so I, I do, when I post these on Mushroom Observer, a lot of times I'll just call them Lactarius section. Um, I think it's del, delicii or deliciosi. I forget. I'd have to look. But it's a section of of the genus Lactarius that contains the the species that have the colorful latex, of, well, probably orange and or red latex in the case of this section. I've found ones also in a hemlock area that have the white, the orange with the white latex. Yeah, that's something completely different. And then the turned section. yellow. Mm -hmm. And I just wasn't sure of the identification, so I didn't. Yeah, show. that's something different. Yeah, well, I can't say offhand exactly what that would be, but if it's got white latex, it's definitely not this. And this, by the way, is actually not a bad edible. Yeah, I, I've um, another reason I like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not bad. I mean, it, it's not. It doesn't have a whole lot of flavor, but it cooks up with fairly nice texture, and what flavor it does have is is somewhat pleasant. So, it's, I like to put them in things where they can pick up some flavor. I've always wanted to get a bunch of either thyanos or or the other one, the one that stains green, and and put them into like Moroccan chicken or something like that. I just never got around to doing that. Something that has a lot introduces a lot of flavor. So. I, I cooked it with um, those um, lycopurdin, the small puff balls, and, oh, okay. and that was really delicious. Yeah, that you, you have like a contrast in textures. Yeah. Put those two together. Nice. Cool. Thank you, Penny. Thank you. All right, Marisol. To go next. Okay. Uh, guys, I really, really don't know anything about lactarius, <laughs> uh, but I am curious about them. So this one was found a few months ago, and when the weather was very cold, I showed this to you uh, in another another time. And the reason why I say that it's lactarius because I did the micro; it had no latex maybe it was too cold to produce it i have no idea but the microstructures point to being an lactarius so it has that special it was growing on a cherry in a rotten cherry tree There were a few of them. Did, did it have a taste? I cannot remember. That was a long time ago. So I work on the micro and I saw the different features. And mm, some cystidia, I guess. Um, this one right there in the kind of center um, is characteristic of lactarius. I forgot the name, Dave. Uh, what? Uh, where, where? Where was? What? What is this a picture of? What part of the mushroom? Uh, it has. Is the this the edge. gills or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The... It's the edge of the gills. Okay. So it has basidia and plus that cystidia with these tips. You got to see one on the top and one on the center. Yeah, part. they're really different looking. I honestly don't look at cystidia all that often with lactarius no. or russula. I tend I I mount the spores in melters and try to evaluate the. Um, the ornamentation, which oh, it needs okay. to be, they need to be mounted in melters to see the ornamentation. Yeah. Oh, but I didn't even know what it was. So this shows that it's a, a lactarius. 
Yeah, it, the mushroom looks like a lactarius. And sometimes yeah. there are some species of lactarius that have very little latex. Oh, okay. Yeah, this yeah, one so, didn't produce any. Yeah, and there are, are some a few species of lactarius. Nothing comes to mind off the top of my head, but there are a few that tend to grow on rotten wood. Oh. Even though they're mycorrhizal, the mycelium oh. crawls up onto rotten wood. There's 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 like maybe two species that oh. that is their favorite habitat, rotten wood. Yeah, some of the wood was almost like hummus, hummus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's I I have found lactarius mm. in that okay. kind of habitat, and I I don't remember a species name to go along with that. Yeah, um, and it wasn't too big. Yeah, those are kind of small, but yeah. size varies quite a bit with some of the Lactaria species. Okay. You can see the Basidia on the right, upper right, with chunky nice. stigmata, yeah, a narrow base. I did it because I haven't, I never did that before. I was curious about the microscopic features. Yeah. But I was happy to know that it was a Lactarius at least, like I could point that it was, yeah. And uh, I can't go to further with them because I don't do oil, so it's too tricky. I saw the spores, you'll see them in one of the photos, and that's it. I measured them, oh, I don't have them. I don't know why. No, you, no, said, no in, spores. you said in your notes, no spores were seen. <gasps> oh, oh, okay, okay. But I love the tip of the cystidia. It has like a little ball. No, another one. Yeah, that's, right there. Right there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Constricted, constricted tip. Cool. All right. Okay, the next one is this guy. As I told you, I have no idea about anything lactarius, except if I find the blue and the paradoxus, that's it. So this one I found near my house like five years ago. And in the, the date in the observation, it says 2012, but it's wrong because um, it's something wrong with the camera, the setting of the, the, the time. But I found it near my house and um, when you cut it, you can see that it was orange inside. And the gills had some kind of greenish and the cap too. This photo is not too good. And uh, slugs were trying to eat it. It was very chunky, uh, the stem, but it has this reddish orangey coloration. But I didn't know when I found it at that time, I didn't know anything about the latex. I have no idea what this was. I only learned that years later. But I, I didn't have the, the mushroom either. It was huge. So I don't know if this one belongs to the group that they was mentioning, the delicious the, the group. Yeah, I'm or not sure if they, if they put these in because they don't have orange latex. But oh. I, okay. I'm not sure if that's the what distinguishes section to Ooh. to OCI or, or, right. or whatever it is, something close to that. Mm -hmm. I think this right. might be Chelidonium. It could be the name that I have in there then. That is the name oh, you have, have in there. Yeah, there? Oh, yeah, yeah okay. I see. Yeah, that would be my guess. Oh, Chelidonium okay. or Paradoxus. Um, which one has uh, Chelidonium has yellowish flesh. This looks kind of old and dried out though, so some of the colors might be a little different than mm -hmm. what you would expect on a fresh one. All right. Yeah, I, I only have those two photos. That's it. That was a long yeah. time ago. Okay. Yeah, let's see what it says for the mm -hmm. flesh of Paradoxes. Nah, it's not, no yellow or orange, just whitish and green. It's, it's probably Chelidonium. All right. This one was found by somebody in one of the forays, and I thought he was very handsome. They call it chocolate milky, <laughs> Lactarius ligniotus. I have no idea what's white ligniotus, but it was, it's very contrasting, the color of the cap and the color of the, the gills and the stipe. It's pretty. 
Those gills are really widely separated. I think this might be Girardii. Oh, it was. Girardii is also not as dark as Lignionis, oh. but when Lignionis gets old, it lightens up. But those gills are really widely spaced. Look at it. Look at the big space in between yeah. the gills. Yeah. Mm. Um, I think this is probably something closer to, if not Girardii. Mm. There's a few varieties of Girardii, and then there's a thing called Sub Girardii also. Mm. I think it's probably one of those. Yeah, I didn't identify it. It got identified in the foray in a Smithby, so <laughs> I have no clue. Yeah, if you have the if the Melky book, I mean, I can actually here. You know what? I can hold up to. I don't know if you can see this. No. There's some of the pictures of Lactarius Girardii. And it does it does look like what you have here. Get out of the space gills. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm going to write that down like times or get out of the eye. All right, thanks. Thanks. And then last one, uh, I was in the Stokes. Uh, it got identified as Lactarius chrysorreus. I think that it, uh, can you put the other photo please? Oh, it has these uh, craters like the texture on the, on the cap and on the stipe. I, somebody identified him. I have no idea. Um, did you notice the color of the latex? No, I don't remember anything. Yeah, if, well, if it had white latex that that turned yellow after maybe close to a minute, which I'm guessing maybe it did because that's probably why you called it Tracer Hort, Tracer Heus. Oh, okay. um, but this is probably Venacea rufescens which is a Tricer heus lookalike that grows with pines, usually pines. And it has more, it has a little bit darker cap. Tricer heus is, is almost white. And, and this one um, is from Venetia Stokes. Rufescens. Yeah, so I, I'm i guessing it's probably Venetia Rufescens, but you would have to see the latex. Ah, uh, no, yeah. Yeah, the latex start, comes out white at first and then it turns yellow. Oh. like sulfur yellow within about a minute or so. Mm -hmm. the, the craters don't say too much. It has to be the color of the lake. Oh, on the, oh, on the, the surface. You mean the, the little light. holes on the stock? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not sure that's truly scrobiculate. Those holes are really small. I don't know what to make of those. Let's okay. see what it says though for Venacea rufescens because maybe that's going to point away from that. And I don't know a lot of these things from the Pine Barrens. The Pine Barrens is like, this is not when I go there, barrens. it's like going to another planet or something. It's everything they, is so different. Yes. This is not Pine Barrens. That was Stokes. We were there. Oh, Stokes. I'm sorry. Stokes. Stokes. Oh, yeah. It's probably, <laughs> it's probably Venacea rubescens. Okay, okay. And is the latex red on the um, Venacea rubescens? No, latex is white and it turns yellow. It's a po it's poisonous species. Oh, I also. thought you were talking about the chrysoreus, because that does it too, right? Yes, they're very similar. But the chrysoreus, or that grows with oaks and it's white, and Ven and Venacea rufescens grows with pine and it's this color basically. Maybe mm -hmm. not, maybe not so much zonate like this one. Uh, let's see if it says it could be zonate. I got the book right here. Um, um, faintly zoned with bands or water spots. Yeah, that's pretty much what you have there. Okay, so the Vinaceo. Yeah, okay. let's see what it says about the stock. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't say anything about the stock being scrobiculate. That doesn't look like scrobiculate to me, though. Those are, I don't know what to make of those little holes. Okay. But the color is Venacea rufescens. That's what it okay. looks like. You're talking about the holes in the cap? Uh, no, no. Those are like stock. water spots, I think. Um, see there's tiny, tiny holes on the stock? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure I'd call that scrobiculate. 
I'm not sure what that is. Okay. But I don't know. Maybe this could be something that I just don't recognize at all. But yeah. since you're calling it Triceraceus, then I'm I'm assuming that maybe you did see the latex was white and turned yellow because that would point in that direction. Mm -hmm. No, but it was somebody's ID. I think I found it, but somebody ID it, so no idea. Oh, okay. Because I know the one you're talking about from the Pine Barrens. I know that one. Yeah. Yeah, it's white. And yeah, it is. The and they it usually has a, yeah. enough latex to see the latex pretty well, and it's white. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. the latex turns sulfur yellow. All right. Thanks. Sure. All right. Okay. Yeah, one more. No, one more. Thank you. Oh, one more? No, that was the last one. Oh, oh, one more. Ah, okay. And look, you got a little friend on this one. Now look at the little, ah, cute. Look at that little cutie pie. Cute. What is it, Luke? What's the spider? Is that a spider? Oh, it is mm -hmm. a spider. Oh, yep. I don't know. <laughs> a, a wolf spider, a wolf spider, or a grass spider, but that's like saying, you know, yeah, no, that's, no. that's a polypore or a, or yeah. yeah, okay. You need to see the eyes. You have to be able to oh. zoom in on the eye pattern. No, the photos be bad. <laughs> okay, so this has it has fork gills. Yeah, and some white, white latex. Things. Yeah. And it stains. I mean, the gills had some stains and the cap too. So where was this? I found it near my, near my house in Smithville. Mm -hmm. oh, in, in the in in the pines. In, no, no, Smithville. In my in my park near in the park near me. In Smithville, where we had the 4 a yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's okay. I don't know, and I don't, I didn't taste nothing. I don't know. It this looks thing. like the margin might be a little bit cottony and enrolled. So let me just review here it has forks from the edge to the yeah point. yeah they, the the yeah. fork gills fork gills can mean either sub valerius sub distance or um deceptivus mm -hmm. and then there's probably a few others also that the staining are doesn't mean anything uh that's what i'm looking up now oh okay. um the staining on the cap is unusual for sub valerius mm -hmm. um sub distance the gills the gills look um kind of distant those gills are a little hard to characterize they look sub distant to me so um sub valeria sub distance gills sub distant close to sub distant and the gills do stain a brown from um uh, this is, Staining brownish to pinkish were injured so on the gills, but the stain on the cap is kind of that's what's throwing me off a little bit here. That's not a something I see on sub valerius. So I'm just looking here to see if deceptivus. Yeah. I think deceptivus, but deceptivus I think gets really like depressed in the middle of the uh, cap, so you know it becomes funnel shaped. I'm pretty sure. Dave, uh, did you say you were looking at? Did you say you were looking at sub valerius? Because I'm seeing here um, yellow or yellow brown spots are staining. Yeah, I'm, I'm the gills. Um, on the cap. Yeah. Oh, I'm, oh, on the cap, sub valerius. Does it say that? Oh, what book are you using there? Uh, the Baroni. Okay. Okay. So that's, I don't see that here in Bisset. Um, so yeah, so you know what I'd say that th that's what this is then. That'd yeah. be my guess. It would it would be either way. It's going to be uh, sub subvalerius or uh, deceptivus. But this doesn't really look like you know what this is not deceptivus. Deceptivus gets a depressed cap center and it becomes scaly. The cap is kind of scaly. So subvalerius far sub distance. That's what I would say. Okay. Yeah, I'm okay. looking. I'm looking in the Bicep book, and the photographs. The one is Lactarius subvalerius 
variety sub distance. And then there's another yeah. variety. But both of them, you know, have kind of the slightly wider space skills. And both of them do have kind of a dingy brown cap that's kind of modeled. Not as not as pronounced as this one, but you can see that trait in there. So I think that's what this is. Yeah, sub Valerius seems pretty good just looking at the photographs. Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, thanks. And compare. Thanks. Cool. And the uh Hello? I'm sorry, I'm typing. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I'm typing. I'm typing the name that Dave was just saying. But... See, I got the names. Thanks. There you go. And now everyone does. Mm -hmm. Nice. Okay, cool. Well, thank you, Marisol. Thank you. Okay, I have some to share. Okay, let's start with this one, Bacterius imperceptus. I didn't do any microscopy, I think, on any of these. This one I found in some pines outside of Philadelphia, in Bucks County. So there's the name imperceptus. We name. Yeah, and I always find it late in the year to in. November and it is pretty dependable in this area. If I go in there and you know towards the beginning of November, you know, late fall, I tend to find big groups of these. So they um, the caps are kind of brownish and maybe a little bit, maybe like a little bit of texture to them. Um, the gills they kind of get a brownish stain to them. You see where they're just been touched. They get a little bit brownish. And the, uh, the latex comes out kind of whitish, but it ages yellow. It doesn't really mm -hmm. show up that well in there, but it does stain yellow. And they're really bitter. Acrid, I'm sorry, not, not, bit, not bitter, acrid. So they burn your mouth. Uh, I love the contrast of the edge, the white line that it shows. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's yeah. really cool with the yeah. color of the cap. Yep, mm -hmm. you see it there. Yeah, that's show. Yep, so kind of a kind of a a whitish latex, but definitely after about five minutes, it's kind of a dingy yellow. And then you see that bruising in the gills. Just a little bit off color. Well, it certainly looks exactly like what is pictured in the Bisset book. Yeah, I don't know. You know, I don't think I've ever identified this species, but it looks like it looks like you got it here. The close gills. They're nice and even. You know, the edges are nice and even. Mm -hmm. Looks just like the the set pictures. Nice. Yeah, awesome. What's the habitat here? Um, needle That's litter. Oh, there you go. Needle litter of conifers. Right. So there you go. There's a lot That's of needles there. there. <laughs> yep. Oh, nice. All right, so there's that name, Imperceptus. Okay, my next one is Lactarius paradoxus. So I find this in the Pine Barrens a lot. I think I find it in Bucks County under um, conifer, under white pine sometimes. So I'm, I'm not as certain about that. This one I felt pretty good about, Paradoxus. I think this was at Wells Mill. I'm pretty sure it is. So I couldn't get any latex out of it, but the flesh turned greenish after it was cut. Mild taste and under pine. So it's a single photograph. So a little bit zony. Uh, as you see, the flesh kind of turns this bluish color. And I had read in the Bissette book that this is this is more common down south along the Gulf Coast, but it's known up into our area. 
occasional in the northern range, it says. And I know we, we've seen this. I've seen other people collect this since then in Wells Mill. That's one of our foray sites in Ocean County. Oh, we found it this year, yeah. Hmm. In Wells and also in Franklin Parker and on Suey Road, okay. which is Pine Barrens. Yep. What, what is the name of this one again? Uh, Lactari Lactarius Paradoxus. I'll go back so you can see it. Yeah, I, I think this one would be easy to confuse with uh, Chelidonium. Agreed. Yeah, but I but the I, the flesh seems to be a little bit more completely blue in this paradoxus, and I think the gills might be a, a little bit different too. Are those gills reddish pink, or is that like a trick of the camera? No, that's the pink. color. Pinkish yeah. orange, it says yep. in the Bisset book for the gills. So, yeah, cool. that looks pretty, pretty much pinkish orange to me. And uh, oh, and you know what? The cut on the stock, you can sort of see, you can sort of imply what the latex color is going to be. And um, and the latex is scant, dark, venaceous brown on exposure and it looks like that's what you're going to get there so with okay. these ones that don't have much latex oh yeah you can always press your finger against a cut or if you have a piece of white paper if you think the latex might be pigmented like with this one it's almost certainly going to be pigmented just press a little bit of white paper against the cut see if you can get a color um some of these guys don't have much latex. I think Caledonium is like that too, if I if I remember. All right. What was the color of the latex on that? Kind of. I couldn't get any latex, but the the book the Bisset book says um, dark, venaceous brown. Okay. So it's like a purplish reddish brown sort of. Right, the color that on the the cut on the stock. That's pretty much what I'm what I'm thinking is is it's going to look like that cut on the stock. Yep. There. Mm -hmm. Cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. So the next one I have is Lactarius indigo. And unfortunately, I couldn't get any latex out of these guys either, because when they do exude latex, it's really intense. And these guys have an intense color. Oof, that's gorgeous. Oof. And when the latex does come out, you know, I guess I had a little bit, right, like right in there. Um, when the latex does come out, it's the same, like, electric blue as this stuff. I always call it electric blue. That's gorgeous. I found some nice fresh ones this summer. The first time ever I found really nice fresh ones and I took them home and ate them. But um, there was so much latex in them, my fingers were all were stained blue. The gills are still really blue on that one for as open as it is. Yeah. I think I probably ate some of these. Some I, I would have eat, I would have eaten that one and these these smaller ones. I was camping, so I was definitely eating these things. A quick question, uh, Dave. When you were mentioning that your hand fingers getting stained with a blue uh, the blue latex, right? So does the color go away naturally? I probably had to wash my hands a few times. The, um, there's one Lactarius, actually a Lactifluus, used to be Lactarius volemus. The white latex stains your fingers brown and your fingers will stay brown for a couple of days mm. be before it finally washes off. I think this blue washed mm. off. It wasn't that hard to wash it off my fingers, but my fingers were pretty blue. I think I might even have a picture. I'm not sure if I put it in with... Um, what I sent to Luke, but I have a picture somewhere of my fingers are all blue holding one of these. Sure, understood. 
Uh, another question that does this blue, I mean, naturally fade away or it always stains blue, uh, stays, stays blue? And another question, well, is that if this blue uh, dye is like similar to the dye mushroom, those like a body pore style, and then they are like, they change color at different pH? Well, I don't think people die with these. Mm -hmm. I think that's what Susan said. Susan Hopkins, I don't think she might not be here tonight, but last week someone asked her that. She said these these don't work well for making dyes. Mm -hmm. And okay. the latex remains blue. It doesn't change color when it gets old, but if the mushrooms will dry out and you might not see much latex at all. You might have to really, really search just to see a little bit of blue on your finger. All right, thank you. Welcome. Okay, so here's a Girardii that I felt pretty confident about. I think, I think this was Poconos. Yeah, State Gamely ends up in Schuylkill County. So, Lactofluus Girardii. Yeah, it looks like that. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, the one that I have. One that you had, yeah. yeah. It looks yeah. it looks like yours, Marisol. Yep. Yeah. A little bit lighter. Mm -hmm. More of a milk chocolate. They're a little darker sometimes when they're young and they're not expanded. And they are easily confused with Lignotis because when Lignotis gets old, the gills do spread out a little bit, but not like not like these guys. Yeah, you can see this was this was a baby, just a little a little one, um, white latex. You can see how wide. The gills are spaced. Um, the, yeah, I wasn't going to say, is this one the only one with the gills so spaced? Subplinth and gallus has widely spaced gills, oh. almost pretty much as widely spaced as these. Oh. Um, the latex stains the gills pink, salmon pink on yes. subplintho gallus. I think that's, I'm saying that right. Um, and then there's another one. Oh, some stinii. Some stinii is um, another one with widely spaced gills. Huh. All right. Let me see. So this one. Um, this one actually got sequenced. I found this down in Mar um, in Virginia. And it was some kind of little milk cap that I couldn't put a name on, either growing in sphagnum moss. So really small. This whole thing was maybe about two inches tall and half an inch wide. The latex was white and unchanging on it. How about Lactarius griseus? I think that's what I had called it originally. And that the color of the cap is highly variable on that species. Um, but but it does this does look like you know when it's gray it looks like this, and the stock is usually a, a little bit grayish as well. And um, the stock is kind of thick on this one. These guys are really small though. The caps usually don't get much bigger than two inches across. What's and the they grow in moss. Lactarius griseus grows in moss. First, I thought this was subgerardii. Oh. But mm. I guess as we see, the, uh, the gills are not. Quite... Yeah, the gills don't look right. The gills don't look right. So I, I had that misidentified there. And then. That's a lot of latex. Griseus usually. Let me see what it says about latex for griseus, because I'm not used to seeing that much latex. Anyway, it, it got sent. In, mm -hmm. It got it got sent into um, one of the you know the North American mycoflora oh. um, bio blitzes, and Steve, um, uh, you know from Purdue, he right. he did the sequencing on it. And came up with Kaufmanii. Kaufmanii. Hmm. Yep. Wow. Hmm. Hmm. Can you Let's click see. the link here? Us here? Can you click that link, same as here, the, the other observation? 
Huh, that's interesting. I've got Kafmanii in the Beset book here. Doesn't really look like that. Was it variation Kafmanii? Oh, that's right. There's variety Kafmanii. So maybe there's a different variety. This one, we're getting into Ohio now. This is. So look at that. Look how much bigger that one is. But he was saying the uh, the sequences were the same. Oh, so so this is also identified as Kafmanii. Oh, pseudomucitis. I, I don't know. No, uh, they he has. <laughs> oh no, nope, the Kafmanii variety Kafmanii has got the most uh, the highest uh, you know confidence I, here. I I noticed well, on yeah. uh, Luke on your sequence to the right the Myco Blitz ID said pseudo. Uh, uh, mucidus, pseudo mucidus. Mm. Well, I don't know what this thing is. That's why I'm showing it because it's it was a mystery to me. This is <laughs> Alan Rockefeller says this one. Oh, this one's not. not this isn't mine. This is this is just the one that Steve. That uh, was saying, same as here, but you're right, it does say Michael Blitz ID pseudomucidus. But then somebody said it's that's their opinion is that's not it. It's probably based on the sequence. Yeah, it's well, Steve's the one that was on the sequence. Yeah, well, Alan, Alan probably looked at it and blasted the sequence and didn't see any pseudomucidus. So actually, pseudomucidus should be, should be slimier than this. Yeah, this one was. Now I do recall it was very. Oh, it is kind of slimy. Yeah, it was very. It was very dry down there. Oh, uh huh. When I was down there. Mm -hmm. That's super cool. Anyway, it was one of these little cool little guys. It was. It was very dry down there, and the only thing I could, only mushrooms I could find were in the sphagnum moss. So. The sphagnum moss that was like near any kind of water. Yeah, that's All a right. good thing to point out because if you're out, happen to be looking for mushrooms and it's you're in the midst of a drought, just try to find wet spots with moss mm -hmm. and, and you probably will find some things. Okay, so before I move on to Dave, you sent me a really nice uh, uh, collection of different things to look at with some nice stuff to compare. Um, let me check in. Is there anybody else in the audience that would like to uh, share from their own screen before we go into Dave's stuff? Anyway, gone once, gone twice. Uh, I have one because last week I did that, but I forgot the naming. I didn't put it. Let's take a very real quick, quick, quick look, if you don't mind. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, Yes, because I, I, for some reason, I didn't put the name on my uh, iNaturalist. Uh, we saw it, but uh, let me share the screen just real quick. Uh, wait a second. Let me see. Where is the sharing? Oh, sorry. Give me a second. All right. Uh, this one, this one. You see here, uh, the screen. I remember Dave uh, and uh, Eager gave some comments, but I forgot to put the uh, I forgot to put the name. So the mushroom has a very interesting edge as a cap. Uh, I forgot you also use a terminology to describe this kind of morphology. The milk stain, um, the milk is white and it stains uh, red and pinkish. Oh. Yeah, we, we called it, uh, this is Igor, we called it uh, Saplithangalus or Merylanticus, which is synonymous. And the uh, term to describe the cap edge is plicate. Yeah, this is one of the ones, the other ones that has widely spaced gills. This one looks a little young, so the gills aren't real widely spaced. Yeah, um, but they're fairly widely spaced, at least. 
Yeah, uh, this one it's, it's fully expanded. The gills are pretty widely spaced, almost like Girardii. So I will just put on the. I will just put a suggestion in the. Uh, Is somebody typing that in? I can type. I can type it right out of the book here. I have the. Oh, yeah. okay. You were just putting it in there. Yeah, it's same as uh, Merylandicus, I think. I'm typing yeah, I it. think it's Merylandicus or Merylandensis. Merylandicus probably. You're probably remembering it better than I am, but it's Mer Merylandensis. I'm, I'm going to check before I type it in and just see. Uh, the size is very big. Actually, it's almost like a f I could say five inch across. This is a very big specimen, five inch. Yeah, they get they get big. Yeah, very the species big. gets big. But what does it say in the? Let me see what it says in the book here for the size. I think actually, Saplithlingaua seems to be the current name. Um, uh, so I'm going to post the link from Michael Kuo's uh, mushroom expert. So this is interesting that the Bisset book says only up to two inches, but I, I have found sub gallus much larger than two inches. Okay, great. This is the only one I want to share because I just lost the name. Uh, I'm going to put it back. All right. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for sharing. I was just looking at pictures of the subplankathalus in the set book. It does look pretty, it does look great. Okay, I'm gonna go back into here and Dave. This is the, do you wanna look at these or do you wanna look at the other ones first, Dave? Um, wherever you wanna start is fine. Let's look at oh, these, these, these are interesting here. Uh, oh, wait, the first one. What's the first one? Um, oh, this is something that I just, I was reviewing my old observations and I came across this one and I had this ID proposed at very low confidence and I looked it up and checked out what I could and it's like, well, this is very likely what this is, Proximellus. It's, it's one of these ones with zone eight cap. And uh, this is an old observation, I think probably a number of years ago. Um, so I don't know if I've ID'd the, this species within the last five years, but I, I checked out the description in the Bisset book and it really, it really seems to match very well. So on Mushroom Observer, you can propose at various levels of confidence. So I have this proposed as could be and I, ch I just upgraded to promising because I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what it is. It has a zone eight cap. See the, the rings, the cap, the colors on the cap are arranged in concentric rings, lighter, lighter, darker, lighter, darker. That's, that's referred to as zone eight. And this is funny. This looks a little like that one that um, Maricel showed before um, that, that I said I thought might be Venacea rufescens. But there's a lot of lactarius mushrooms that have caps um, that have this zone eight pattern. Well, Dave, yours kind of looks uh, too big for uh, Proximellus. And we only find Proximellus in pine barrens in the all, uh, pine and oak uh, 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 habitat. Yours is, says here, mostly oak. So I think it could be something else. Well, let's see what it says in the book. Proximellus. Yeah, it says only up to two and three eighths inches. So that's a little bit big. Um, otherwise, it, what, what do I have written in the notes? Do I have anything there? Because I might not have recorded enough. Taste bitter, becoming acrid. That, that one panned out. Latex, scant, colorless. I think Proximellus has a white latex. If yeah, well, it says white. It says scant white on exposure. I know, so maybe that is something else. So I, the, you know, there must have been some reason why when I first put it up there, like I only put it up as could be, and I had just genus Lactarius at higher confidence, meaning, you know, that 
that prop you know might not be proximal so maybe it isn't and is does proximelos have, has a very short stipe oh um, very yes so, yes it does. oh yeah very. three quarter inches long yeah so maybe, this might be something else what, what does the stipe look like on this dude oh it's pretty short it's pretty no, short. no it's, it's like half of short. that in it's relation to this short. I'm sorry. In relation to the size of the cap, this no, it's really short. I have well, I have two observations pretty short, about though. that. In relation to the size of the cap, it's I, think, I think the biggest factor here against proximalis is the size of the fruit body and the fact that the habitat doesn't match. Well, what does it say here in Beset for the habitat? It says on soil under oak. Oh, um, oh wait, no, no, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong thing. Um, on sandy soil under oaks. New England south to Florida, west to Texas, also reported from Michigan. So it's got it's got a pretty big um, distribution. So it doesn't get that big though, it looks like. You're right. I, Michael Quo is saying only- Well, it's, it's, a, it's a coastal species, okay? It's a coastal species, so it's from Maine all the way to uh, Texas along the Gulf Coast and the coastal plain of the Atlantic and the East. And let's not forget that Michigan is a maritime state because the big- Yeah, lake, I know, it's on the lake. Yes. So the things that we see here that are specific to the Pine Barrens, like some of the species of the Bolites, we also see over there as well. Okay, so, you know, if there's a, a lesson to be learned from this one, it's that without microscopy, um, some of the other traits can combine in such a way that it's misleading. And so I did not scope, I didn't have any melters when I found this. So I wasn't really able to look at the spores. And I don't think I put anything there about the spores. No. Anyway, so without without being able to look at the spores, you're missing a really important piece of information. Um, well, it looks like Jim Burkhardt is here, so maybe he can add uh, to. Uh, oh, to okay. Uh, because uh, he often finds proximalis in the pine barrens as well, and is very familiar with the species. May yeah, I now, say something? Good. Sure. Okay, so this uh, late in the season, um, in the fall, uh, I found this that I will, Nina told me Lactarius proximelus, they have been calling it like that, and two different areas in the Pine Barrens, and I did the, um, the DNA, and it's not Lactarius proximelus, <laughs> it goes 92%. So it seems to be like an undescribed species. Marisol, let's not forget that people identify mushrooms from ID and then they run DNA and then they put the name that they think is correct. The DNA and the naming, it's two different things. Okay, you have to have a reference point and that reference point has to be the type collection. So I can call a mushroom anything I want and put the DNA in, you know, in the, in the database with the name that I want to put in. It doesn't mean I'm right. Yeah, one thing you can do though is you can at least search the name on GenBank and see how many how many um, sequences have been labeled as proximalis. And you can also then check to see um, who submitted them. So, you know, you can do a little more research and try to maybe get a little better idea if, um, if there's enough stuff out there to compare it to on GenBank. He said that there, is, there, are, not, there are not enough uh, sequences. Yeah, how, if you search prox, like Harry's proximalis mm -hmm. on GenBank, how many yeah. how many things come up? Not too many. Or she says that it may, may be an undescribed species. So we don't know. Well, if there's not that many species being called proximalis, then there's just not much of a point of reference. And and if there's only one or two sequences that, as Igor is saying, they might be incorrectly named. Like I said, on, the, the biggest misconception of, you know, when people blast sequences, they think that whatever is in GenBank is correct. It's, it's far, oh. it's, far, 
Okay. It's full of junk and undescri- you know, un, um, uh, 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 misapplied, incorrectly named species. We have to look at the metadata and see if those sequences are actually associated with valid publications, something you can trust. Oh. And maybe then you can you know, do, do some hand waving and say, well, I think I'm going to go with that name. Oh, all right. I don't know. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Have we had enough of this one yet? Yeah, that's enough of this one. <laughs> okay. And then you have this one that says two similar milkies distinguished by tree association. Do you think? Yeah, these are pretty cool. They're very similar. And according to you know what I've read, the difference is tree associates. Um, so the one uh Vietis is a birch associate and you can see here i'm not it's not real high confidence because i didn't do any any um microscopy on this i probably did not have melters at the time but but it looks it looks correct i mean this is gray capped thing it's got the stock that is also gray and maybe it's if I had broken one of these stocks, I think it'd probably be hollow inside, but a lot of lactarius have hollow stocks. So that's not in and of itself is not a real um, telling feature, but I think that's what those are. And that it was, they were growing in birch woods or woods that had a lot of birch. And, and the other one that's lumped together in, there's like another see, uh, another observation right down there. This is this one I'm more more certain of because I find this one a lot. It's um, I think it's Cenarius. I think is yeah Cenarius grows in beech. There's always beech near this thing, and usually they're a little darker, a little grayer than these on the caps. But you can, if you show the picture though, you'll see it's going to look a lot like that thing we just saw. A lot of times these don't have much latex. Sometimes they latex comes out pretty, you know, a fair amount, and sometimes not. It's white latex. I don't think there's much staining to be found on these. Dave, I found yes. those on the beach. Yeah, beach. Yeah, yeah these are beach. Uh -huh. Yeah, these are always beach. We have a lot of beach woods around here, especially once you get in the higher elevation. Me too, me and too. I find ones. these all the time in the beach woods. Every, every you call Scenarios. Scenarios. Okay. Now that was a little strange though. This hairs on the stock. I could not find any reference that mentioned this. Um, so that made me wonder a little bit. But I still think this is scenarios. I find find them every year. And I don't know if I mounted spores and melters. I might not have had melters at the time. I, it doesn't look like those are mounted and melt. No, those are not mounted and melters. I don't think. Even if they were, you can't on this through this microscope, you can't see the ornamentation. So lactarius spores do not vary a whole lot in terms of size and shape. But the ornamentation varies quite a bit. So I have a better scope that I don't get good pictures with because it's a binocular scope and I have to point the camera into one through one eyepiece and then I don't get a good picture. So what else do we have here? Oh, okay, yeah. So you got this stuff. So I sent a whole bunch of them last week. These, um, um, so what should we call this? I'm not even sure what that is. There's a whole bunch of lactarius that I found in Franklin uh, Parker last fall, and I, I don't know what to call them. So I was I thought maybe somebody might know. Those are near the top of the list. Yep, I'm just looking. You have some good groupings. We'll kind of yeah, jump into yeah, them. yeah. I tried to make groupings, so okay. things that are kind of similar. So what should this be? I don't even remember. What was I talking about? Let's see. Taking a while to load, I guess. Ah, oh, oh, this one. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I think I've already discussed this one with Igor. Uh, I think there's probably some comments from both of us here. This one's kind of strange. I mean, some some aspects point towards ligniotis, and some aspects point toward fumosis. 
The dark color points towards Lignyotis, but it's not real dark. It's and the gills are not white enough to be Girardii. Um, and there were some other features that pointed toward Fumosus. So, but Fumosus is usually a little lighter than these. Uh, but Fumosus is kind of like it's it's got this sort of like smoky look to it, but usually not this dark. And I think I did write down some things about the spores. So the spore pictures are not that good, but the descriptions in the notes, you'll see probably that I wrote some things about the spores in, into the notes. Um, you don't see it on the pictures though, so you just have to take my word for it. So spores, okay. Um, uh, with warts and ridges, oh, up to 1.5 microns high. Now I'm just guesstimating those heights, to be honest, but you can sort of get a feel for it. If you look at a lot of spores of Lactarius and, and Rusula, you sort of get a feel for, you know, how big the warts are. What are the big warts? What are the really small ones? What are the really big ones? And 1.5 microns is, warts are pretty big actually. And what did I have there? With, with a lot of connections, but not necessarily forming patterns. So that, um, fit pretty well with fumosis. I'll look in the book here and see what they say. Uh, fumosis variety fumosoides. I think that's what I, oh, I have like fumosis variety fumosis. So what does it say about the spores? Ornamented with ridges that form a partial reticulatum, prominences up to 1.5 microns. So I don't, did I say part? Did I say maybe a partial reticulatum? Partial reticulatum means it's broken, like it's broken up. Um, okay, partially to nearly. Part, yeah. So that fits pretty well with the description. So, but what is it? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I my best guess would be Fumosus friday Fumosus, but this could be Lignyotis. So. Lactarius mushrooms can be really hard to identify, like Russulas. So, so okay, so these are from these Franklin Parker Preserve. I think they might all be the same thing. I think I found quite a few of these right where we parked the car. <laughs> so it would be, you know, pines with oaks mixed in, basically. Luke, is that that thing you found, maybe? What was that name you had? Imperceptus. Imperceptus. Is that what it is, you think? That's what I found uh, in the Pine Barrens. They just renamed Imperceptus years ago. I have a collection saved. Um, well, I'll tell you what. It certainly looks like what Luke showed before, yeah, honestly. That's... Yeah. I think that might be. I'm just not used to finding this. So did I put anything in, into the proposal? I don't think I did, but maybe I did. Maybe I proposed something. No, no just like Tyrus. Okay, so Imperceptus. That sounds yeah. good. My I don't collection. think I did a lot of work on this, but but that's what it looks like. But then there are a few other ones. You know, maybe some of these other ones are something different. I thought maybe they were all the same thing, but well, let's see what we have here. I suspect this might be the same thing, just older. Looks a little dried out. Uh, my collection, uh, the camp was wet, but not viscid. And it, uh, you know, to touch it, it felt more like a dog's nose. And uh, the taste was slowly acrid. And I think that's what I got with these slowly, slowly uh, acrid. Uh, yeah. These are these are dried out though. This this batch was dried out. And oh, immediately acrid. Okay, so that's something different, probably. The milk was scanned and uh, whitish. That's what I said in my notes. Yeah, there wasn't much. Oh, this is a different one already. This is a third so one. This is yet another one. Out. This one I think is probably something different than the other. The other. I don't know. These were really. These were very vis viscid. This could this be Proximellus? Yeah, this looks more like Proximellus. Okay, so all right. Okay. But who knows? Yeah. I can see that. I can see that being that. Yeah. Okay. 
Sorry, I was zooming through them because you were saying you thought they might be all the same thing. That's okay. No, that you know what? That was enough. Like I, I can make some. I can propose some names now and and maybe look them up and see if it makes makes a little more sense after I start looking. So, yeah, proximalis and imperceptus. Oh, okay, good. But, and this is the fourth one. That's the fourth one. So, is is that the same as the others, or oh, that one looks? Similar to that. Imperceptus, maybe? Yeah. I don't think yep. this is imperceptus. No? Okay. Oh, no. It, it looks a little bit more zone eight. A little bit. Yeah. It's, well, it's kind of faded toward the margin. It's kind of blotchy. Yeah. But I'll check. I, uh, I'll, I'll check some sources against the name imperceptus because I have no better name. Yeah, for this looks like it has a hollow stock too. Yeah, I'm surprised that John Burkhardt is not entering this conver this conversation here. So, even though he's there, yeah, I don't I don't know these. Yeah, I'm not sure how much. I think I may have taken some of these home and examined them a little more closely. I'm not sure, but. I was there for two days and I think these were found on the first day and I'm not sure if I even took any of these home. And there were a lot of mushrooms. <laughs> well, you go to the Pine Barrens in the fall, you find a lot of mushrooms. I'm just afraid that uh, the Pine Barrens did not get enough coverage in Bissett's book or any other book for that matter. That, yeah, that might be the case. Sure. Yeah, and these, these species could be endemic to this ec uh, ecological niche. There you go. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so. Very confusing. That's a good point, Igor. Like I say often, when I go there, it's like going to another planet or something. It's everything is so different. Okay. Yeah, we can. There's a lot here, so if we go fast through them, that's probably going to be all right. But I, you know, maybe somebody might have an idea on some of these too. Um. Where did I find this? Oh, Moon Lake. This is local. I found these local. So maybe I don't know how much work I put in on this. Oh, the spores with thick based warts and fairly large warts. This these were kind of perplexing. I couldn't figure this one out. I may have taken a lot of mushrooms home this day, though. So maybe I didn't give them that much time. So you can't really you can't see the ornamentation very well. This microscope does not resolve very well. But I think the warts are big enough on this that you can sort of see. Yeah, you can sort of see some of the warts are are probably pretty big. See, they're thick. They're, so even though the uh, the sharpness is not really good through this scope, you can still see it's got some thick, big thick warts. Maybe a little over a micron. Anyway, nobody knows what it is. That's okay. We can just move on. Probably in an oak area. And so let's see, what do we have next? Oh, oh this is an interesting one. I don't know what this is, but there was, so this is by this pond, Schumann's, Schumann's Lake or Schumann's Pond um, up on top of the Red Rock Mountains, high elevation. We're over 2000 feet above sea level here, but there's a boat. Somebody uses it to fish a rowboat. Rowboat was turned over upside down and these mushrooms were growing uh, underneath the rowboat. So the color might not be correct. They might be like really too pale. So I don't know what these are, uh, but it's just an it was interesting thing thing to found. I I I, I uh, pushed this rowboat over to see see what rowboat looked like, you know, in case I ever wanted to use it. You know, take some oars up there and use it sometime. But um, um, the mushrooms were growing right underneath the boat, which was kind of interesting. But I don't know that I don't know what species they are. 
they probably don't look like what they're supposed to look like. So these are this, okay, so here it is, Deliciosi is the section. I just couldn't remember how quite how to say it before. And so these first two, I don't have a species name here because these are the ones that are sometimes called Deterimus. But if, when you start reading about Deterimus, you know, a lot of books will say only under spruce or only under pine. And I find these in lots of different coniferous habitat and they might be more than one species. In fact, I think probably there's more than one species. See the green stain in the middle? That's these stain green. These have orange latex. A lot of times the latex is very scant and you have to cut and, and press your finger a little bit to see the orange on your finger. Um, usually the latex does not just ooze out because there's not that much of it. So this one is not staining very much on the underside. Sometimes they do and sometimes they don't, but you'll generally see green stain someplace. Um, um, these, want, these are not thionos. And by the way, thionos is named something else in the uh, Bisset book, it's not called thionos, it's salmon something, salmon color or something like that. But anyway, this is different. This, this is the green stain, one of the green staining ones. So, so these are, they're not, you know, you can eat them. They're easy to learn to identify because of the orange latex. So, and the bugs get them really quickly though. A lot of times you, you know, I'll find them and I'll pick one and it falls apart because the bugs have, you know, insects have eaten through it. So, but when, if you find them without bugs in them, you know, they're, they're not a bad edible. They're pretty good. But like I said, they're easy to learn if, if they grow, you know, in your area. I find these in the Poconos most often. Um, spruce, pine, hemlock, some kind of conifer. There's always some kind of conifer around. Okay, it's taking a minute there to load, I guess. So I think this is probably going to be, if not the same species, something pretty close. If it loads. Oh, uh, here we go. I guess. Oh, there we go. Okay. So it's they even said there what I had until recently called Lactarius de deterimus. So there we are again. Now this time you see the green staining on the gills, right? And and the cap looks almost completely green on this one, just a little bit of orange. But you look at the gills and you see the orange, and see there's hardly any latex in there. But you can sort of see on um, like the exterior the skin on the stipe, right? You can see it's kind of orangish. If you were to press your finger on that or on the cut gills, you probably can get a little bit of orange on your finger and, then, and that would be from the latex. So I probably wrote down something about the spores. Uh, the spore pictures are not very informative really. Um, you have to, look at the descriptions, but those look like they don't have much ornamentation at all. Um, I mean, they all have warts. All of these Lactarius, Lactifluus, and, and Rusula spores have warts. It's just a matter of how big they are and if they're arranged in any sorts of pat, any sort of pattern. So did I say anything there in the notes? I, I forget uh, about the spores. I'm guessing that the warts are very small on that one, does it say? Yeah, spores with warts up to 0.5 microns, so that's small. Yeah, so it says variably isolated or connected by ridges. You, so you don't, you don't see that in that picture. You need, you need a better microscope to see that stuff, which I do have, but like I said, I don't get good pictures with it. And then thionose. So we went on a hike in the, when we were in the Adirondacks this year and the, it was along a stream. There were a lot of areas that were very wet and there were a lot of these thionophs. They're really beautiful looking mushrooms. 
And so these were particularly nice ones. And you can see where the it, the gills are a little bit damaged. You can see there's they look a little wet and orange, but that's from the latex. So these have orange latex also, but they don't turn green at all. There's no green stain. There's the scrobiculate stipe, little potholes. I think, I, think these, um, I think these things like the cold because when we were in Newfoundland, we found a lot of these on that that uh, foray. Yeah, they're more of a northern thing. I don't I don't find them down here in Northeast PA very often. Very rarely, I find these in the Adirondacks and and in uh, northern Vermont because those are areas I just happen to go to a lot. Um, and and these are very common in the Adirondacks and in Vermont. So they're just, you're right, they, they like a, co a cooler climate, really. And, and this was late in the season, too. We were in the Adirondacks late in the season this year. We were there in, I think it was like the end of September or the first week in October or something like that. And there were a lot of these. So there had been some chilly nights already in the Adirondacks. OK, what do we have next? So oh, this, um, Argolaceae ifolius, I guess that's how you say it. Um, and this is an oak species, I'm pretty sure. But since, so I'm, I'm trying to review here. Uh, what does it say there? Does it say? Perimeter, it uh, perimeter of stand of pine, oaks mixed in. Oh, a pine here. Oh, um, okay, I, where oaks, where oak mixes in. Okay, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, I know where I got these. Um, yeah, near nearest near a grove of Scots pine, but but there were a lot of oaks. So if you go on the perimeter of this stand of Scots pine, there's there's oaks that mix in. So you can see the needles there. And I'm pretty sure that's what these are. I I think I probably looked at spores. Uh, not too many of these like lactarius are considered to be edible and a good number of them are probably will probably make you sick unless you boil them three times so that came up last week where someone was uh someone had suggested that most lactarius mushrooms might be edible i think probably most are not see the staining on the gills there i think mm -hmm. that's probably a, a telling feature so and isn't that bloom uh, the bloom on it is that a oh the bloom yeah it's got like a bloom yeah i think that's also a telling fee so let's see what it says very quickly i don't want to you know take forever on these guys uh but that staining is pretty distinctive looking it's kind of a brown but maybe slightly grayish or maybe even a little bit olive olivaceous let's see what it says for our so i okay, have another so I have an observation of these from the Pine Barrens, mm -hmm. and that's what I have the latex changing from changing to dull cream, creamy white changing to dull latex staining tissue brown. Yeah, olive, olive brown to dark brown where bruised. They yep. taste very slowly hot. Yeah, I'm not sure I even tasted the fun, surface finely pubescent when young. So that's the same, pretty much the same as a bloom. Maybe just a little more textured, like a bloom with a little texture, pubescent. Yep. In the photograph that I have from the Pine Barrens, you can see some of that bloom has just been wiped away. Uh huh. Well, look, even on this one, the little one on the far right, you can see probably where I touched it. Yeah. You know, there's a little bit of it missing there. So I'm pretty sure that's what that is. Um, So there's this um, stand of pines that I go to every fall, late October into November, even into December. And it's like the last place I find mushrooms. It's at a low elevation, not far from the city of Nanticoke. And um, it's, it's a great place to find mushrooms when there's no mushrooms anyplace else. Like all the way into December, I find mycorrhizal mushrooms. Uh, 
Okay. So you have these two that are very similar to each other. Got your yeah, various, these are similar. They're, they're these really sort of, um, they're sort of cool looking because of the colors, but they look kind of beat up. But even if they aren't, <laughs> they, I think, scrobiculate stocks on both types, I think. Um, the one is more green than the other. That's how I, I, this is atroviritis, I think. That's the one that's really green. And there's staining on the gills. Gills are pretty close. And I think it's the other one that has the stock that's noti noticeably scrobiculate. And that one would be sorditis. Or there's another name instead of sorditis. There's two names that are sort of interchanged. They're synonyms. So this one's local. I found this one local. And the other one, sorditis um, or tarpus. Tarpus is the other name. And um, it's not completely green, but it's pretty similar to, so are these actually different? Well, I'm saying they are because that's, you know, that's what I've learned from the books, but you know, who knows? I mean, how much work has actually been done on these? I don't really know. So this is green also, but it's got, you know, it fades, the color changes toward the margin to a, like a dingy yellow color. And when you turn it over, you can see the yellow a lot more. And I don't know, is, I thought this was the one with the scrobiculate stock, but maybe not. No, it's, it's also awesome. got pretty right. tight gills. Yeah, okay, I guess it is. Yeah, maybe maybe there's another, maybe I have another view. Um, oh, it is, yeah, yeah, you can see it. You can see the potholes, there they are. Yeah, pretty tight gills. The other, the atroviridus has pretty tight gills also. They're pretty similar. In my in my estimation, these two species are pretty similar. And you have to wonder, um, can you really tell them apart by morphology? And I, I'm saying you can't because that's that's what I've learned from the books. This is another one, you know, I would not eat these. See how that nice round stain develops? This was in the Adirondacks, I believe. And I think I found these under like some cedar or something like that. I think, if I remember correctly. Let's see. Here's your notes. Spruce and pine. Spruce and pine. Okay. Lackawanna County. Oh, that was not in the Adirondacks. Oh, okay. Oh, that's um, right. That's um, one of the spot that I go to often. I forgot I found that there. Okay. Next up. Actually, the atrovirus, I think that was the one from the Adirondacks, but that's okay. Just go on to something else. Okay, oh, this on. is just the strange fruiting. That's just that's just weird. <laughs> this people will get a kick out of this one. So I think this is Lactarius quietus in Canis. It's a real common species, but it's got it's it's got like no distinctive features, so it's which makes it hard to be confident about identifying, but there's a mushroom growing on a mushroom. <laughs> that's that's just bizarre. I mean, they're really both nicely developed, and one is literally growing right on top of the cap of the other. So, I just thought people would enjoy seeing that weird sort of thing. It's cool to see them both so well developed too. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, they're like perfect oh. specimens otherwise. <laughs> I, for anybody that likes this kind of stuff, if you do Facebook, there's a, a group called Dumbass Mushrooms That Don't Know How to Grow. <laughs> yeah, this fits in. <laughs> this, yeah. This, is a, this is a prime example of what you'll see in that group. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll have to try to look. Yeah, Dumbass Mushrooms That Don't Know yeah. How to Grow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh uh, wait, what 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 do you what that mean? Like is the group about like uh like they wanted to grow mushroom or they no. just no make it's, a, it's a it's a group uh, that shows only deformed looking mushrooms. Oh uh, sure, actually Dave um can uh or Luke actually for this uh like Carius, what's the name uh Q 
the the strange food in quietus, right? In, in can um, quietus variety in canus. Yes, when you say that, actually, very common. Uh, I actually see them a lot. I don't know what it is. Um, is do they have a very like a strong uh smell? Like it's very strong the smell when you break apart. I think I don't know that you might be. Uh, are the ones you're talking about are they small? Yeah, they're small. Yeah, they look very similar to this one. They have that a might be camphoreus, yeah. but camphoreus yeah. is darker than this stuff. Yeah, well, let's, let's see what it says. I forget if the next one. Is yeah, camphoreus is, is the next one. I'm gonna look up the odor for quietus because I have the book right here. Um, I think I think quietus now. I think quietus has a sort sweet. of sweet smell. It does often. Yes, yes, it does. You're right. Both of you are right. Odor sweet, fragrant, often like burnt sugar, or rarely not, rarely not distinctive. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. So I these I'm that. calling camphoratus right here. Now, right. some mm -hmm. people say that camphoratus smells like maple syrup, but I think they just oh, smell no. like witch hazel. No. Camphor. No, like camphor. Yeah, that's what I say. <laughs> pretty, pretty common species, probably a species complex. Yeah, are these two edible, the quietus and the camphoratus? I would not eat quietus. Some people eat camphoratus. Some people like dry them out and grind them up and use them as a as a spice. Um, I don't think I've ever eaten camphoratus. Maybe a long time ago. I'd have to look in my notes. I should try it out just for the heck of it. It's not going to kill me. And I prob it probably doesn't even make you sick. Let's see what it says in the Bisset book because they'll they list that ability for a lot of things. Let's see what it says about camphoreas. I should try them out just, just for the heck of it. Oh, edibility unknown. <laughs> okay, it's probably probably more than one species mixed in there. I think this is on one. I had dried these out and I powdered them up and I was talking about the John Plushke and he kind of mm -hmm. laughed and he said, yeah, lots of people are experimenting with these, but he said lots of people get sick too. And he like just laughed and walked away. Oh, <laughs> well, okay. Maybe I won't try them then. Now, who knows? Who knows? You know, you know how John is. He's, yeah. That's what he said. And he just like giggled and walked away. So, yeah. I, I don't know what yeah. that is. But, it, but needless to say, I never tried the ones that I had dried and ground up. Because I had read that. I've... I'd read that too, that people grind them up and use them as a seasoning. Yeah, but there might be more than one species under that name as well. So then, so here's this little group, the Chelidonium yes. paradoxus indico. They're all, these three are all pretty similar, uh, especially Chelidonium and paradoxus. Mm -hmm. I, I think I've got, I think the paradoxus I have here might be from the Pine Barrens. Mm -hmm. so, then it, so then it would probably be correct. Um, but here was a really nice Chelidonium. This was, um, yeah, these were growing under on a lawn under pine and spruce, planted pines and spruces. Doesn't that look like an indigo from the top? Really no. looks almost like it's going to be blue, like you expect it to turn it over and see see it be more blue on the bottom, like those indicos we were seeing before. But you turn it over, and then that's what you see. And I think I should have sectioned one of these. I hope I remember to do that here. Oh, you can see the latex there. See the latex is yellow. It's like a dingy yellow. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, not all that different from Paradoxus. Paradoxus has darker latex, I guess, is one of the main you know, um, differences. Uh, yeah, and, and, and the flesh is not as at quite as completely blue. Paradoxus apparently has flesh that's a little more strongly blue inside. Would you say this the was, uh, would you say the gills look a little more orange? Yeah, maybe the gills are a little more orange as well. Yeah, but I don't see paradoxus very often. I think maybe the only time I've ever, the only times I've ever seen it, have been in the pine barrens. I think the milk of paradoxus is purple, um, and uh, yeah, the gills are... yeah, it's darker. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, not just dark. I think Starter. it's a different color. So I don't yeah. think I don't think this is paradoxus. I think this is one of those. Uh, oh, this is not paradoxus. This is caledonium. Yeah. yeah, I'm 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 pretty sure of this. You know, I'm I'm pretty confident about this one. 
being right uh, we, Chelidonium, Chelidonium. Right. We had read earlier that it was like venetia, dark venetius red for the dark venetius brown. It's it's called yeah. And, and this is clearly not that. Yeah, this is the grasshopper spit. Yeah. Yeah, that's Grass a good way to say it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, I did not coin that term. It was Peck who did that. Yeah. Or one of those. Good night, old Marisol. Ones. Good night, Marisol. Okay, so that's Chelidonium. Chelidonium yeah. or Caledonium? I I don't know. <laughs> All right. I say it's one way sometimes and the other way other time. I, I'm not really sure. By the way, so I, I, that um, Chelidonium, or however you pronounce it, is Greek for turtle. So oh. somebody thought it looked like turtle, my like turtle. Huh. So, oh, this was from oh. Wells Mills. Yeah, that's where mine so, was from too. <laughs> yeah. So, so this was not quite the Pine Barrens, but not that far away. The gills are colored differently. Mm -hmm. So I don't see this species very often, but I thought I'd just show it. It's a contrast, you know, the Caledonium. And and this one even looks even more like indigo, but the latex is not blue. And you might have to search for the latex. You might have to press your finger against the, the cut flesh or gills. Chelidonium. Chelidonium. Okay. Okay. And then finally, uh, indigo. Yeah, that yeah, was these... the, uh, that was the Google Translate pronunciation. So I think it's pretty accurate for for that. Okay. Okay, Chelidonium. Yeah. So this were these were the best ones I ever found in this rest area. That uh, I think maybe I showed these last week. Actually, oh, yeah. Uh, these had a lot of latex. See, you can see it on my fingers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and looks... when I got them home, even more came out. I mean, my looks fingers like, got really blue. That looks like acrylic paint, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it does. Indigo? Mm-hmm. Mm. Oh, yeah, look at that. So I think that was back home. Yeah, that's once I was home, I cut them and then got more of it on my finger. And... Then I cooked them up with scrambled eggs, but I cooked the mushrooms too long before I put the eggs in, so the eggs didn't turn green. Because I wanted to have green eggs. This has to be a contender for one of the oddest mushrooms. Yeah, yeah, really. Yeah. And it's not a bad edible. You know, it's not great. A little bit grainy, but it wasn't bad. I thought it was okay. You know, in the Bisset book, they recommend long, slow cooking to break down the graininess of Lactarius in general. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, in general. Um, the um, cyanos and, and, and the other orange latex ones, they're not really all that grainy. They're kind of crunchy. So um, we're, it's getting late. So I think we yeah, jump go. ahead. You want to jump ahead to like these? We haven't seen these yet. The Volimus. Oh, well, we haven't really seen those, have we? No, we haven't. Yeah, go ahead. I'll do the same thing I did last week and copy, mm -hmm. as long as you don't mind, Dave, put all these links sure. in the uh, chat so people can do some exploring on their own. Uh huh. Okay, so Luteolus. Yeah, Luteolus is, is very much like Volimus, um, but it's, it's sort of an ivory white color, maybe with a little yellowish here and there, like this one. And it has. Um, I think the gills are not quite as close as Valimus, but fairly close. There you go. You got the abundant white sticky latex that'll stain your fingers brown. It, it, the latex stains the gills brown. These have a very, very fishy odor, like, like Valimus or Corrigus, or is it Corrigatus? I think it's Corrigus. Um, and, and these are a good edible. These are a good edible. They, you know, once again, identifying lactarius, it's a good idea to nibble and taste and make sure you don't have an acrid one. And these are not acrid. So these are going to have a mild flavor. Uh, the abundant <laughs> latex might put a person off. You might think like, wow, there's 
these are these are so goopy you know why would i want to cook them but that goes away when you cook them look at you can see the latex on on the i put that on my deck and, and there were like pools of latex for me what no, this is darker. Carubus is a real dark one. So this is Volimus. Yeah. Oh, no, yeah, this is this is well, Volimus. Volimus can be a little darker than this. These are and these are kind of pale Volimus, but this is to Volimus, this, this is Volimus. This is what they look like. They have close gills. Once again, a lot of latex. Oh, the sure. latex stains the gills brown. It takes a few minutes. So this was, I cut through the gills to let the latex come out, took a picture of the latex. And then I probably, I'm pretty sure I probably took another picture a few minutes later to show the color change on the gills. There you go. So there's the brown stain where, where I had cut it. And these have a strong fishy odor yeah, that disappears yeah. as you cook. While you're cooking them, you'll still smell it. Um, but it goes away once they're cooked. And these are considered to be a choice edible. The Ludiolus is a very good edible as well. Probably just as good as Bolivus. Um, that smell gets worse as you cook it. It gets, yeah, but it goes away eventually. Yeah, when you first start cooking it, you can really smell them. Same thing with Corrigus. And Corrigus also has um, that same sort of odor. This is Corgus. Yeah, this is Corgus. Corgus is supposed to have a corrugated cap, but not always. And usually you can see the corrugated parts, usually toward the margin. You see on the margin of this one where it's wrinkled? Those wrinkles are, a, that's just a typical feature on the cap of this species. And a lot of times the whole cap looks like that. Um, but the other thing with Corrigus is to distinguish it from Volimus is the, the gills are a little darker. So the Volimus has really pale gills, like uh, maybe just a little different than white or ivory. And these are a little bit yellowish, a little bit darker, but otherwise, and the, and the stem is usually a little darker as well. Um, like this one, just the color is just a little bit different. Uh, otherwise these are, as far as edible qualities, Pretty much the same as Volimus. Uh, these don't get buggy. Um, a lot of these lac lactifluous species that have a lot of milk don't get insects in them. And I wonder if that's possibly part of the evolutionary strategy of, of these species to keep insects from um, destroying them too fast. Uh, because I imagine if an insect tries to burrow into one of these, um, you know, it, it has it ends up having sort of an unpleasant experience you know with the, all this latex coming out yeah that's so, a speculation so christopher a speculation asked, christopher speculation. asked um when they get when this group gets old and rotten do they turn black oh wow oh maybe yeah maybe some do and some do some lactarius like fluids do I don't know. When I find old black ones, I usually I just say, "What's that?" You know, <laughs> yeah. don't, and don't figure, don't put a name on it. Um, but you know, um, I suppose it would be interesting to maybe if I find some of these in a spot that I go to a lot, maybe just leave a few there and keep track of them. You know, that's always an interesting thing to do with a lot of different kinds of mushrooms. So. Okay. Health, you know, Helvis is kind of interesting if you have a minute. And that could be the last one. If, if, the one that smells the coconut? Helvis <laughs> used to be Aquil, Aquilifluus. Yeah, but it's got double I. Aquilifluus. But now it's called Helvis. And I'm not sure why, because I think both of those names are European. I'm not sure about that. Oh, These are pretty big. They smell like maple syrup. They, they, cooked up they have nice texture and they taste great but every time i ate them i got a stomach ache so i stopped eating them and in fact the the field guides used to say 
there was a Bisset Field guide from years back that said these were a good edible. And then the next Bisset book that came out said they were slightly toxic. <laughs> so somebody else must have had the same experience I did. Um, I, I made one time macaroni and cheese with some of these in them, and it was so good. It, the fla this really, really nice flavor went through the whole casserole dish. And, but then I got a stomach ache, so I don't eat them anymore. They grow in moss, mossy areas, um, probably favoring conifers. I'm not sure. Let's see what it says here in, in the Bisset okay. book. That's the one that smells like cooking. Yeah. Elvis, what do they like? Scattered and in groups or clusters on the ground in wet conifer and mixed woods among sphagnum mosses and blocks. Okay, that pretty much coincides with where I find them. Okay, so, all right. Well, I guess that's it for tonight. Okay, so, um, let me see. Kind of multitask oh, what do here. we want to do next week? Yeah, I was that that was my uh, question. What do we want to do next week? So I think there was a couple different suggestions I've, I've heard recently. One was Quartinarius, somebody had asked about. Um, and then I think Maricel said that people had discussed spring mushrooms. Mm -hmm. I, I think we probably should wait another couple few weeks for spring mushrooms. It's too early to talk about them yet. Yeah. I, then, I vote for I vote for uh Cortinarius. Spring is still a little bit early. But the issue with Cortinarius is that it's a very difficult group. It's a very difficult. Yep. Group. Yeah, there's gonna be a lot of a lot of um people showing the Cortinarius mushroom and, and then there's there'll be just like a lot of silence. Because nobody will yeah. know what it is, right? <laughs> but 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 it will be interesting. I mean, Quartinarius entails a lot of a wide range of interesting morphology, so there will be some interesting things to look at, even if we don't know what they are. Yeah. So yeah, Quartinarius sounds good to me. Yeah. I'm having a hard time. I can't. I, for some reason, I can't get your uh, links to copy, Dave. Oh, like, Are I, you, I like it, trying to copy and paste them. Yeah, yeah. I was trying to copy and paste them so people could look at the ones that we didn't get a oh, chance geez, I don't, to. I don't know why. It's hmm. probably my. It's probably my computer. My computer, I think, is on the downward spiral. Well, my computer's really old. My computer. Well, how old is my computer? It's like nine years old or something. I think, right? I think so. Yeah. My computer is pretty old. It uses some old old Windows. Well, I'll tell you what. If people want to do some more exploring on their own, all they have to do is go to Mushroom Observer and look up Dave and look up all of his Lactarius because he had a lot of Lactarius stuff in there. Oh, God, yeah. There's <laughs> pages and pages of Lactarius yep. and Lactophilus. Okay, so does... Um, so Courtney, yeah, just click on name. You just go, go to my Mushroom Observer... Dave W. and and then just there, just click on name, and then there'll be a you know, A B C. Just just click on L. Cool. All right. So mm -hmm. how does do you guys is, is that a done deal? Do we do coordinaries next week? <laughs> I had three sure. People, three people say yes so far. So. All right. Looks like it's coordinaries. We better study up. Those are like five thousand species or something. <laughs> okay. that's a good question somebody I, somebody once told me there's like 1700 species and i went around saying that and then nina corrected me one time and she was like oh there's five that six thousand species yeah well who knows really right that's <laughs> who knows that's that's some serious conjecture there but uh there's definitely I've, I've i've often heard people say that it's probably the most diverse group in the world Anyway, we'll dig into it deep next week. Um, if you uh, get a chance, look up Wikipedia, read up on Cortinarius. Um, if you go on, if you're a Facebook enthusiast, Shannon Adams, she's like the Cortinarius expert. She does a lot of cool Facebook stuff with Cortinarius. Oh. So anyway, Shannon oh, what's Adams. The what's the name? Can, can you, type it? Can you yeah. type it? 
Shannon Adam. There you go. Uh, it's a it's a female, I guess. Yes. Know? Yep. Okay. Somebody out on the West Coast, and uh, she most of her work is done in the West Coast, but she comes out east here and does work out here too. And she's been publishing a lot of stuff. So, oh. Okay. Anyway. Oh we're gonna, wait. We're, you mean publishing, publishing in a journal? Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, yep. Okay. Putting names out there, publishing names. So. Sure, sure. Okay. Well, we'll dig a little deeper into that next week. All right. So, yeah. I'll look her up. Everyone, everyone, have a great week, and uh, I'll see you next Thanks week. Thanks a lot. All right. Good night, Thanks, everyone. everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night.